Hello and welcome. This is part four, number 10 of Common Sense Economics, which focuses on investing in the long term. And in this part of the book, they suggest investing in stocks if you're investing in the long term. And then as you get to the point where you start needing to withdraw to transfer to bonds. Okay, so I want you to look at this graph and, and see that this blue line is the S&P 500. That represents us just investing in stocks, okay? The orange line is the 10-year treasury. Uh, that is a bond, okay, from the government. And look at how much more the S&P 500 had, uh, had as far as returns go, okay? You can see that these stocks grew a lot more. I do want you to notice as well, while there is that, uh, you know, ups and downs in that blue line, this, the, the line representing the stocks, it's also consistently gone up, right? Over time, I mean, it, it's consistently gone up. Sure, there's times where it's gone up and down, but it's gone up drastically over time. Also notice that for bonds, the value is actually relatively stable over time. It's, it's gone up, there's less ups and downs, but of course it's gone up slower, okay? So, yes, the, 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 there are lots of ups and downs when it comes to stocks, but it has a stable trend and that is going up in the same way that and it, sorry, in the same way, bonds, they are also stable, okay? Or even you could say more stable than stocks are, but they don't have as high returns, okay? So uh, as this suggests, for the long term, you wanna have a whole lot of growth, and then as you start willing to withdraw that money, you, you don't want it to be losing uh, value, right? You don't wanna have, wake up one day and your retirement account isn't worth that much because you're just waking up on a day where the stock market's down, okay? As you get to the point where you wanna start withdrawing from your account, You'll start, instead of having, you know, 90% of your portfolio be made up of stocks, you'll start transitioning more and more as you get older and older to the point where it's becoming more and more likely that you're going to retire based on, you know, however your preferences are, you'll start transitioning more and more to bonds because you want your portfolio to, to have a more stable value. And that's what bonds can give you. That said, though, bonds aren't exactly risk free. There are some risks that come with investing in bonds. We talked about the, the risks already with stocks, right? We, we've talked about already how they can increase and decrease in value and how they get their value, right? Some stocks will, will lose their value because the company uh, you know, is, is not profitable anymore, or, you know, just based on where you are in the business cycle, right? It, you know, if, if the whole economy is going through the tubes and most of the time those companies are also going to be losing uh, their value on the stock market as well. Uh, but when it, comes to, when it comes to bonds, you see, a bond gets its value from a how much it's worth, right? It, you know the the what we call the uh, par value of the bond, right? If it's a thousand dollar bond, that means one day I'm going to get a thousand dollars back. However, you know if it's a ten year bond and I'm getting a thousand dollars back, that thousand dollars in the year 2010 is not the same as a thousand dollars in 2020, right? Uh, so because of inflation, bonds can lose their value, right? So if there's even more inflation, or if, you know, maybe in 2010, I thought inflation would be happening at 2% every year, and instead it happened at 5% every year, you can see how that would reduce the value of my bond that I bought greatly, okay? It's also uh, good to note that, you know, if, if my bond is earning, you know, 3% interest, okay, and inflation's happening at 2%, I'm essentially netting a 1% gain in real value, right? Because uh, inflation's happening at two, but I earn 3% interest. So I'm earning more on this bond than I'm losing through inflation. But if the inflation rate goes up to 3%, 5%, then I, I'm actually, you know, if it goes up to five, I'm actually losing money on this bond, right? Overall, because inflation is eating more than that bond is, I would be much better uh, taking that money uh, you know, it, it, sorry, not buying that bond instead of buying that bond, it would have been much better for me to, you know, buy some other investment that could return me uh, a uh, a return greater than inflation, right? And that's, of course, this is one reason why we talked about why inflation is so bad, because of course, if you can't find an investment that can beat your inflation, you're going to take your money elsewhere to another country where uh, the inflation is not going, it is not going to be as high and you can invest there and be able to beat inflation, okay? So that's one risk. The other risk is going to be interest rates changing. Now we talked about in the previous section, we were talking about you know portfolios and how bonds get their value. A bond's value can change depending on what the market interest rate is. 
Yeah, if I buy a bond and it's returning to me 3%, because that was the interest rate on the market at the time, if market, if, if, if on the market, uh, people all of a sudden are now, uh, you know, borrowing money for 4%, people are going to loan money to them and get the 4% return. They don't want to come to me and, and, and try to buy my bond off of me that has a 3% return because they can get a, a, a higher return somewhere else on the market. So if I want to be able to sell this bond, I'm going to have to lower the market price for it, which then means I'm, I'm going to be out some money, right? So that makes my bond lose value if interest rates go up and if interest rates go down, well, hey, well, that's, that's, that's the good side because that means you know my asset got more valuable but of course you, you do risk you do run the risk of interest rates going up and having your bond lose value on the market okay so bonds aren't exactly risk free okay but there's certainly uh less there's certainly less variance when it comes to bonds in how much they can change in their value okay so that's why you know i don't want you to think they're the risk free by any means but certainly, you do want to build, use the stock market to build up your portfolio, get a whole lot of value. And then as you get to the point where you're wanting to use those funds, start transitioning to bonds as those will have be more stable. Not entirely stable, right? not 100% foolproof, right? Nothing in life ever is. Uh, but it'll be a lot more stable than uh, the stocks will be, right? Because you don't want to wake up one morning, right? Imagine having all of your portfolio in stocks in 2007 when the recession hit, right? Imagine... Uh, you know, here with COVID, right? People, uh, now the stock market's doing fine now for whatever reason, we could uh, take some guesses as to why that is, but this is not the video to do that. Um, you know, in 2007, oh my goodness, right? The whole stock market, it, it, it plummeted in value. And if you had all of your retirement in the stock in the stock market, then and you were living off of your retirement, man, I mean, shoot, if you're, if you're living off of, you know, whatever percentage you're getting, on returns from your portfolio at that point, I mean, you'd have to go back to <laughs> go back to work, right? The last thing you would want to do is sell, right? Some people did that, and that's horrible. They lost a whole lot of value. Essentially, they sold when their stocks were worth nothing. When if they would have waited long enough, the stocks would have gone back up in value, and they would have been able to live off those. Right? But you'd have to go back to work, right? But if instead they transition a lot of their value to bonds, well, then they wouldn't necessarily have to worry about the market crashing because hey most of the most of what you're living off of is coming from interest off of bonds so you're good okay so as you near time it's very important that you transition to bonds because you are less uh susceptible to downturns in the market impacting how much you are going to be able to live you know uh you know stress free you don't have to worry about whether or not the market's going to turn down because hey you're going to get your returns anyways what you do have to worry about that is is making sure that uh, you know your government isn't causing there to be rampant inflation and uh, making sure that uh, you know your cost of living is well within the interest on those bonds. So when it comes to long-term saving, oftentimes we call this retirement, right? If you're saving for a time where you cannot work, this is retirement. And thankfully, the government of the United States, and I'm sure other governments as well, up Darth have made it so that they are they, they want to encourage you to save up for when you can no longer work because of course if you are responsible for you then the government doesn't have to be responsible for you right so we want as many people to be self-sufficient as possible or at least that's the idea behind these accounts you see we have a a whole smorgasbord of retirement accounts so we call these individual retirement accounts or an IRA right IRAs there's a whole subgroup there's there's whole s different sections of subgroups when it comes to IRAs IRAs just stands for individual retirement account a 401k is typically one that you get to have through an employer and your employer will make contributions to it alongside you a 403b is a similar setup but for public institutions that is government institutions i can get a 403b uh, because i work you know for a public school um Matter of fact, I think the school contributes to a 403B, but uh, you know, I, I was working on paying off debt for the last two years, so I haven't started contributing just yet. We're getting our emergency fund set up, and then we'll start contributing. But I, I actually think uh, that because the with a 403B, you're not a, you're not able. Uh, I haven't looked into it too much, but but I've heard you're not able to uh, invest into as risky of assets. Uh, like you can with uh, you know other types of IRA, so I actually may not be investing in a 403b. I may actually be going outside of my uh, IRA offered by my employer and going and getting one on the market instead. 
So, I don't know, maybe I can update, update you guys on that and what that ends up turning into uh, and what I end up deciding. Um, but the whole point behind these is that you notice, guys, they are tax deductible, okay? These type of uh, retirement accounts, a 401k, a 403b, these traditional IRAs, they are tax deductible, meaning that when I earn my paycheck, if I put my money into these retirement accounts, I don't pay the tax on that money. So if I deposit $500 into this retirement account, I don't have to pay the tax on it, okay? Which is pretty cool. I mean, that's quite the incentive, right? Because if it was, if I was taxed on that money, then I'd be able to put in, what, 300 instead of 500? So by them saying, hey, uh, you don't have to put, you don't have to pay taxes on this money, you can go and put it in, well, that's pretty neat, okay? So it means that I can put in more money than I otherwise would be able to if the government didn't have this. So they are incentivizing by making it so I can put in more than I otherwise would be able to. They're incentivizing me to do this, which also means, you know, think about it comparing to someone else, sorry, something else that I could be spending on, right? If I instead wanted to spend money on video games, you know, if I'm taking that money from my employer uh, and it's going into my bank account, then it's gonna be taxed, right? So, you know, if I have $60, you know, I have to earn actually like closer to $80 if I want to buy a $60 video game for my employer because that $80 will be taxed and I'll get the 60 and I can go buy the video game. Whereas if I take that $80, I can just put it into a retirement account and I don't get taxed, right? So you can see how they're trying to incentivize you to save. It makes you more reliant. It makes you more reliant on yourself as opposed to being reliant on the state, okay? Another type of retirement account, which I totally recommend for almost everybody because most most people will uh, not make over the amount that will take you out of the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA is pretty friggin' dope. So the bad news is you have to pay the tax on the dollars now, okay? However, when you withdraw, it's tax-free. One thing I didn't mention here, folks, sure, you, when you deposit money to a 401k, a 403b, traditional, income, uh, traditional uh, individual retirement account, yeah, you don't have to pay the tax when you deposit, but you do have to pay the tax when you withdraw, okay? So after it's been accumulating all of that compound interest and you're taking it out to live on retirement, when you're taking money out, that's gonna be taxed. Oh no, but with a Roth IRA, you pay the taxes before it accumulates all of that compound interest. And then when you withdraw, because you paid the tax before, now, the withdrawals are tax-free. So when you're retired, super Mai Tais on the beach somewhere, tax-free, okay? Now, there are limits to this, right? Incredibly wealthy people can't use this. However, I think it's just shy of $200,000 in 2020 for a married couple if they would like to use this. I think uh, the maximum you can contribute each year is $6,000. Okay, so you know, you, I, I myself want to be contributing, you know, 15% of my income, but you know, for me and my wife, you know, it that six thousand dollars a year is, you know, at some point that's going to be, you know, getting close to what maybe five percent for us. So we're going to have to find somewhere else. You know, we'll max out our Roth IRA, but we'll have to go somewhere else and find a way uh, for us to hit the rest of the are, uh, you know, 15% that we want to be investing, right? And you are able to do that, right? You can max out your Roth IRA and then go somewhere else, right? We are nowhere near close uh, to being at that $195,000 at which you cannot <laughs> use it, right? Because you can't earn too much to use it, right? Uh, I like this little graphic that I have here. Um, you can see that for both of these, right? Anyone uh, can use them, yeah? Anyone who anyone can use them. So for the, for the Roth, though, if you do make too much, you can't, right? You can see that down there at the bottom. And then how much you can, can you contribute each year? These are actually outdated figures. You can see it says 2015, 2016 there. Uh, in 2020, I do believe it is 6,000. And then if you're 50 years or older, it's 7,000. Guys, the reason why they have that mechanic there for being able to contribute more when you're older is because it's kind of like a catch-up mechanic. They're saying, hey, you you know, you, you don't have that much saved, so we're gonna give you the ability to save more if you are behind. But that said, once you get to 50 years older, I mean, you might as well contribute more if you can, uh, even if you aren't necessarily behind, right? But of course, you know, it's, it's important that you make the decision yourself, look at the cost, look at the benefits, right? You know, how much interest are you gonna generate, uh, you know, over the course of, you know, what, if you're 50, you're soon, I mean, I imagine, I don't think I'll retire till I'm 70 plus, right? Especially with all the advancements in, you know, healthcare. 
So that's, you know, 20 years. Uh, if you're 55 and contributing something, I mean, that's gonna, that money's going to double twice whatever you're putting in, right? So if you put in that extra thousand dollars, that's not going to be a thousand dollars. It's probably going to be closer to four thousand dollars by the time that you retire. So that that thousand that thousand dollar difference can really add up. And of course, it's important to notice that you know when I am 50 years old, assuming that the Roth IRA is still a thing. Uh, that these numbers are going to be very different. Same for you. But keep this in mind, and certainly when you guys start going into your workplace, um, try to see what they have, right? And uh, see if you can hook yourself up with a Roth IRA, because whatever you're using, you know, make sure you are thinking about how much you actually want to save. Uh, do you want to hit that 15% number? Do you want to do something more closer to 10? Certainly, make sure that whatever decision you're making, you're actually, you know, you're, you're actually taking your uh, your contributions and you're multiplying it across. There's plenty of calculators online where you can see whether or not you'd be able to retire and live comfortably on uh, your retirement. Okay, and how much you'd have to uh, save to do that. Okay. If you want to be one of those everyday millionaires, right? Most of them become everyday millionaires because of this right here, their retirement accounts, okay? So, uh, 